you. All good. Thank you. Thanks, Noel. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It really is wonderful to be here. Um, and I am really happy to talk to you on the theme of preserve. I thought a little bit about that word and I realized that it is both noun and verb. So we preserve things as an action, as a verb. But there are also preserves. There are places in which we protect things, like the Rachel Carson Preserve up in Maine. And I kind of liked that formulation of the idea really as a way to bridge to privacy, which is what I really wanted to talk about. And so um, I'm going to talk to you today about the preserve of privacy, the spaces that we need to protect. But because this is Creative Mornings and because Noelle asked me to talk about the relationship that the IEPP has had to art, I want to share with you that story. So in preparing, what I did was go back and watch some of the videos of uh, prior Creative Morning speakers here in Portsmouth. And I have to tell you, my anxiety peaked because there's <laughs> been some phenomenal speakers here. And one of the things that I saw that they did that was really powerful was they shared not only the substance of their message, but their journey and how they got there. So before I get to a lot of the art and the privacy, I want to talk to you about my relationship to art because it's probably not what you might think. Um, I'm not an art historian. I'm actually not really an artist. I build stone walls on weekends at my house and that's about as creative as I get. They're straight and they stack and that's it. Um, Really quickly about the IEPP, we are the world's largest privacy organization. We have 50,000 members in 120 countries around the world. We have a staff of just under 200 here in Portsmouth. We have offices now all around the world, a significant office in Brussels. Um, and we are growing as this issue of privacy grows. Significantly, we're a not-for-profit organization and we're also not an advocacy organization. We're policy neutral. Our job is to train and educate, inform the people around the world who are tackling this issue of privacy every single day. So that's who we are. Let's talk about my relationship to art. So uh, Noelle mentioned that I bounce back and forth. I am Canadian, I feel very Canadian, um, but I have very deep roots. I do, I feel very Canadian. Um, <laughs> but my dad worked for a tech company, he's Canadian too, worked for a tech company in Massachusetts. And after my parents divorced, he married this wonderful woman, um, Barbara Hughes, my stepmother, and she owned a gallery in Massachusetts, in Framingham, Mass, called Artique. Think of it like Kennedy Gallery here in town. And uh, while I was growing up through high school and college, I worked in the gallery. I started framing um, and did a ton of framing in the gallery. Eventually actually worked my way onto the shop floor, onto the, the gallery floor and actually sold art. The other thing that happened was my stepmother had this book in our living room on the coffee table, Shock of the New by Robert Hughes. It was uh, written and published in the 1970s. Robert Hughes is an amazing art historian from Australia. And this was a book that describes the rise and growth, the explosion of modern art in uh, the 1900s. And um, I would spend hours in this book. We didn't have social media or smartphones back then, and so we actually had to read things. Um, and, and so I love that book. Now, when I was working in the gallery in the 1980s, it was the same time that the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston was doing one of their first blockbuster shows. Some of you may remember it. It was the Renoir exhibit. And I hated this piece because <laughs> Every single person who went to the Renoir exhibit bought La Bala Bougival, this piece, and I had to frame it. So I, <laughs> I did that at least 40 or 50 times at this gallery, so much so that I really hated it. When I got a chance to sell art on the show floor, um, on the gallery floor, I decided I'd be a rebel, a bit of a renegade, and I would push some people to something that was way more progressive, way more challenging for them. So that was Frank Benson. Um, <laughs> Frank Benson, the American Impressionist, this is Eleanor, um, which hangs in the Museum of Fine Arts. And I actually don't mean to denigrate this. This is one of my favorite pieces of art. It's really uh, radiant, if you've ever seen it at the MFA. So. I have this early kind of seed planted that art is part of my life, that I really like it, I'm selling it, I'm reading about it. 
Um, and then the dark years emerge. I go to college. <laughs> I go to college, I work for a couple of years, I go to law school at this law school, the University of Maine School of Law, which is a phenomenal law school, but it's actually housed in this building, which a couple of years ago Architectural Digest said was one of the eight <laughs> ugliest university buildings. I mean, seriously, look at that. It's as if the Night King from Game of Thrones was turned into a building, right? Um, so I attended University of Maine School of Law and it was the long sort of desert years of art in my life. From there, I worked at an insurance company and I was working on tech and privacy. I was hired as a chief privacy officer, as a, a head of privacy for a, a tech company in Massachusetts. And I started working in the field of privacy law. Now, this is a privacy law. <laughs> not much design, not much art going into it. This is a privacy law book that I actually co-authored. Not much design going into this, right? A little brutalist in its nature. Um, and this is the work that privacy professionals do, that privacy lawyers do. We write all of those privacy notices that you don't read. It's like <laughs> an author or a copy editor's greatest nightmare that all of that work that you do never gets read. And in fact, it never ever gets read. <laughs> but because this was the mid-1990s and the internet was exploding, I found that I was doing a lot of speaking. Um, a lot of people were interested in what are the risks of privacy law? How do we manage this new issue of e-commerce and internet law? And so even though I was very young in my professional career, I ended up doing a lot of public speaking at conferences, actually doing a lot of teaching at law schools. And what I found was that privacy law sucks. <laughs> actually, I should qualify that because this is going to go up online. And, and as I lead the world's largest organization of people who work in this field, I don't want to really be associated with this message. No, it sucks from the perspective that it's really hard to get people to understand why it's important. It's really hard to get people to understand why privacy law matters to them. It's really hard to get them impassioned and energized about the idea of privacy. And then in 2004, something happened that really changed everything for me. I was reading the New York Times at home, and I stumbled across this article, which was talking about something pretty simple and straightforward, and that was Damien Hirst, the modern artist, postmodern artist in London, um, had had an auction at Sotheby's in London, and a piece had been sold called The Fragile Truth for $2 million or something like that. And I looked at the piece, and then I dug it up and found an image of it. This was the piece. And I realized that this piece, called The Fragile Truth by Damien Hirst, spoke to me. That it said something to me about the issue of privacy. I realized, regardless of what Damien Hirst thought he was creating when he built this piece, that what it was saying to me was increasingly our privacy our medical histories, our secrets, our vulnerabilities were being held behind glass walls. And it really resonated with me, it spoke to me. And so after that moment, I used this image when I was teaching a law class at the University of Maine School of Law in that ugly building. Um, and I'm speaking to the students in the class and I put this slide up and every head popped up. I connected. I had connected with every single person in the room. And what I learned in that moment is that art really engages thought. Mary Beard, a really famous historian, she's phenomenal, just wrote a book about how we see. Talks about art not being about the person who made it, but what others made of it. And that's what I really like about art is that it forces us to decode what we're seeing. It forces us to go through some mental gymnastics. And so from those early days with Damien Hirst, I realized that I could start using art to educate, to energize, to create passion in this field, and also connect this issue of privacy back to something very human. Because going from a big dense law like this to, well, what does it matter to me in my day-to-day -day life is a tough trip to make. So 
When I'm talking about physical privacy, our bodily privacy, I use Lely's Venus from the British Museum. She's hiding her nakedness, and everyone immediately understands exactly what that means. When I'm talking about emotional privacy, that we have thoughts and feelings and ideas that we need to protect inside of us, that we need space in order for those things to exist, I use Michelangelo's expulsion from the Garden of Eden in the Sistine Chapel. Notably, Adam and Eve are not covering their physical nakedness, they're covering their faces because of shame. And then people immediately get the idea of emotional privacy. When I'm talking about our need to communicate with each other and create intimacy in our relationships, I use Vermeer's woman in a blue dress. She's reading a letter, she's fully clothed, nothing inappropriate or, or um, exposing is happening here, but we know this moment is private. Were we to walk around a corner and see this woman reading this letter, we'd step back. We'd know that social norms tell us that she's doing something absolutely intimate and private. It's a moment that she needs in order to create a relationship with whoever she's communicating to. So communications privacy is so much easier to explain with art. Spatial privacy, the fact that we need places for repose and rest and protection, is so much easier to describe with Peter de Hoek, this image of a woman delousing her child. This is really a phenomenal issue when you, or, uh, image when you deconstruct it. Peter de Hoek has given us a strong vertical line down the center of the piece. And on the right side of the piece, we have all of the things that are private to a home. This is actually a toilet, that's a bed, and the woman is doing something that is pretty sensitive. Her daughter might be ostracized if the rest of the community knew that she had head lice at that moment, and so it's a very private moment. On the other side of the piece, the doors are open and sunlight is coming in. He's telling us that we need these spaces. So art allowed me, and I just did it with all of you, to explain that there are all of these various constructs of privacy. Physical constructs, emotional constructs, spatial constructs, communicative constructs of privacy. And instead of using law, art allowed me to unlock those and force people to go through a process where they started figuring it out themselves. But art does more than that, too. It tells stories. One of the things that I've also learned in educating about privacy for almost 25 years now is that I could do a deck of slides that describes every one of the components of a privacy law and people would retain some very small percentage of that. But if I tell a story that conveys the message, they keep it forever. And so when I stumbled upon this painting by Titian, which documents the um, myth, the Greek myth, of Diana and Actaeon, I realized that I had a real treasure on my hands. So the story, really quickly, Diana is a goddess. She's bathing in the woods with her attendants. Actaeon is a hunter, a mortal. He's out with his dogs hunting. He comes upon Diana, and he invades her privacy. Titian, the Italian Renaissance master, is really masterful here. He shows the invasion by Actaeon pushing a curtain away. Diana's a goddess, though, and so what does she do? She splashes water on Actaeon's head for this violation of her privacy. He is turned into a stag. His own dogs chase him and rip him apart and kill him. So what's the moral of the story? Yeah, I know. That is like 30 seconds of high drama. What's the, what's the moral of the story and what sticks in everyone's head? It's violate privacy, get killed, right? <laughs> and when I'm talking to businesses around the world and they're trying to understand what the fines are in the Can Spam Act, that's really obtuse and difficult to uh, figure out. When I say, look, there are human consequences to violating privacy, they get the message really quickly. I also like the fact that privacy is a preserve. Privacy is a space in which we need to protect certain values, certain human truths that we know are very important. And in that way, I think there is a preserve of privacy. And I want to connect it to all of you who work in creative roles. You need privacy. You need space to create. You need space to innovate and think great thoughts. And in that way, I actually think there's a very strong connection between the idea of privacy and the idea of preserve. The idea of privacy and creating spaces in which innovation can occur. 
Art does other things for me too, though. One of the things that I really like about art, and Simon Shama, the noted art historian from the UK, said this, art has awful manners. Art is not always built, created, to make us feel genteel or happy. Sometimes it is. Pieces that my wife and I hang in our house, we put those up because they make us feel happy. But art doesn't always do that. In fact, sometimes art is created in order to force us to sit with awkwardness. And in privacy, that's a really powerful thing because we don't always have the answers in privacy. So Shepard Fairey, in this piece, tells us, you know, it's not just some institution, some organization, some faceless organization that might have face in its name that's looking at us. <laughs> it's us. We are looking at each other that when we talk about privacy in today's society, it's your eye that is looking. Um, it's your eye that is doing the, the invasion of privacy, if you will. And so we need to negotiate that balance. He doesn't answer the question. He just poses the, the issue for all of us to struggle with. Or Ai Weiwei, Chinese dissident artist whose studio was surveilled by the, uh, the PRC in China. He carved in marble a replica of one of the surveillance cameras that was outside of his <laughs> studio. And I think what he's talking about here is the coercive effect of surveillance, how uh, surveillance actually is a mechanism of control and power. He doesn't answer the question, but he certainly makes it very awkward and forces us to think about it. Or this one by Rembrandt that I find just so compelling because of the eyes in the piece. This is the biblical story of Susanna. Susanna, who was um, interrupted, violated in her bath by two elders from her community who then tried to blackmail her. And it wasn't until King David of, of biblical fame interrogated them that the truth was borne out. But Rembrandt paints this piece as if we have violated her privacy. And in her eyes, you can see not only the pain, but also the lack of privacy, the shame even. And that is not her doing, that is our doing. And that's really awkward. Um, there's certainly elements here of the predatory male gaze in this piece. And whenever I look at this piece, I feel awkward. And I, I don't necessarily like the feeling, and that's OK, because that's a place that we actually can educate from and learn from and really learn a lot about privacy. Privacy does more, or sorry, art does more um, as well. The law is a really slow moving tool. As you know, Congress is not getting much done these days, <laughs> right? And so if we want to wait for a law to help us understand an issue, it's going to take a long, long time. Art is much more nimble and responsive to the issues that we see in society. In fact, it is an early warning system of some of the challenges that we will see. And so nine years ago, Rossifer Ruggeri was looking at the intersection of social media and our identities by painting his wife's Facebook page on her face. Um, uh, Heather Dewey Hagborg. We brought her five years ago to the stage of the music hall for an event that we ran called Navigate There. Heather is exploring the issues of genetic privacy by creating portraits that she has created out of DNA samples. But here's the kicker. She goes around New York City and gathers DNA samples from gum, from hair that she finds on the subway, from nail clippings, other things, randomly and anonymously gathering these things, extracting the DNA, using the known markers then to create an image of a portrait. Um, and it really does force us to think about some of these cutting edge issues associated with gen genetic privacy. Tadashi Moriyama, Two Cities Desiring to Merge, he exhibits at the Dowling Walsh Gallery in, uh, in Rock, uh, Rockland. Um, a phenomenal artist really exploring the frenetic nature of our relationship with technology, or this one that I love so much. And I'm going to show you a really quick video, but I have to prep it. This is Nicholas Roy. He's an artist based in Berlin. And Nicholas had a shop on a main street in Berlin that had a shop window. His studio was in this old shop. 
And he was getting frustrated because as people were walking down the street, he's an artist and he was always doing interesting things in his studio, people were stopping to look in this big window that he had. His privacy was being violated. He needed that creative bubble in order to innovate and create. So what did he do? Well, he's an artist. He decided to explore this issue. So he got a couple of servo mo motors, a surveillance camera, wrote a little bit of code, and put a curtain on a string to do this. Here we go. <laughs> So there it is. So it really is funny um, and it's great, but I think that Nicholas Roy is, ex is explaining or exploring the idea that we have a sense of futility, a helplessness around how we think about privacy in today's world. One of the questions that I get the most as I travel and speak is, what can I do? And I always feel kind of sad um, because I don't have a great answer right now. And I think Nicholas Roy is exploring that feeling that we don't know how to feel autonomous and empowered and have agency over our own data and, um, and take control of these things. Art lets us explore that, explore that leading edge in a powerful way. All right. Now let's turn to the business. I've shared with you how I use art to tell stories, to engage thought, to connect communities of people around the world to the work that we do. Now I wanna connect it a bit more to the business because the IEPP actually has found that art is an incredibly important tool for us. So given the success that I was having in speaking and using art as a mechanism to connect to audiences, a few years ago we decided to launch an artist in residence program for our largest conference, the Summit, which we hold in DC every year. It was just three weeks ago down in Washington. Uh, we had 4,200 attendees from over 50 countries around the world. So we have reached out to artists both locally and nationally, internationally now, and each year we commission a piece, they come to the show, they speak. Um, this is Lincoln Perry, an artist based in York, actually, who had gone up to New Hampshire to Diana's Baths in North Conway. That is from the myth, same story. I actually saw this piece in the George Marshall Gallery in my hometown of York, and my head almost exploded. I was like, oh my God, that's Diana and Actian, and that's Diana's Baths, and that's in New Hampshire, and Lincoln Perry lives in York, holy moly. <laughs> so we, it really was exciting. My wife was met with me, she knows. Um, I get excited about stuff. Um, so this is a modern version of Diana and Actian. So we commissioned Lincoln to be our artist in residence. And then Noelle and her amazing team and our graphic design team, we have Bethany and Lindsay here. Um, they incorporate that art into all of the design that we do for the show. Um, I really love how they incorporated some of Lincoln Perry's pastels and then the offset of the font here, the asymmetry in the font, it forces people to engage with us and think about our show in a different way. It also sends the message that we're not just sort of a meat grinder conference, right? We are being very thoughtful in curating what we are putting on stage for our members. This is Will Sears. He was our artist in residence last year. You might know him as a sign painter and muralist. He did the big painted bu building on the Kittery Connector. Um, Will Sears is phenomenal. This is a piece, ah. this is a piece called Private. Um, and he sign painted the word private onto a bunch of barn board and then cut it into puzzle pieces, which I love. I love the idea of this. Um, this is Natalie Maybach. She did the Watchers of Copley Square. She went to Copley Square and created this sculpture to document the surveillance that was happening in Copley Square over the course of a day. This is the, um, the art collective that we had this year. It's a group from Europe who created something called Cell Phone Disco. 
And it was a wall, a panel of LED lights with sensors on them so that when your cell phone went by, it could sense the data flowing in and out of your cell phone. I'm not exactly sure of the technology, but then the lights would change as you waved your phone in front of this panel of lights. It was really fun to watch all our members and conference attendees waving their phones on this big screen. Again, Noel and Bethany, Lindsay, the team um, that did such phenomenal work incorporated it into everything that we did, including our stage design. Um, and so that extension of art into our graphic design, into our programming, and into what we do um, is really part of the IEPP. And it's a powerful mechanism that we have to bring people to our conferences. We did indeed have Margaret Atwood as one of our keynote speakers. What's that? Legend. Legend. The legend, Margaret Atwood. And, and I, I have to tell you, I was struggling when I was doing my name badge because it says always hold on to. And then I realized the answer has to be um, your purse. <laughs> and, Here's, uh, and here's the reason, Margaret, Margaret Atwood, um, I guess some years ago was doing a keynote at a conference, left her purse backstage and it disappeared. And so now whenever she speaks, she takes her purse out with her. Uh, so always hold on to your purse, that's my answer. So we have other things that we do to draw a crowd as well. And we explore privacy through art and use art as part of the business of the IEPP all the time. Some of you two years ago may have seen the exhibit that we did at 3S Art Space. Um, I'm not sure, but I'm kind of sure that the IEPP has the largest collection of copies of 1984 from around the world. Uh, we've exhibited in Brussels. We've exhibited in Amsterdam. We've ex exhibited this collection in, uh, at 3S Art Space. And it's actually in the lobby of our building now. So if any of you want to stop by, you can see it. What I love about it is that graphic design is art. And uh, graphic designers have been, over the 70 years that uh, 1984 has been in print, been challenged with the idea of creating imagery that is evocative of the themes of the book. And guess what? Privacy, surveillance, the coercive power of observation, those are big themes. And so those book covers are um, really phenomenal for us to engage our audience, to connect with them, and help them understand the issues that we tackle. <laughs> Let me uh, talk about how um, art also serves the business purposes of the IEPP. Um, all of those collections of art that I've mentioned, the artist in residence stuff that we've done, the 1984 uh, exhibit, it lives at the IEPP. It surrounds us every day. We even have some additional pieces. These are emoji paintings that Lisa Nunes has done. She's a Kittery-based artist. In fact, whenever I'm driving home through Kittery, there's that one intersection, and Five Line is on my right, and the old elementary school is on my left, and that's where Lisa's um, uh, studio is. I feel like the radiant glow of creative energy whenever I'm going through there. Um, and uh, we also bring it into the design in our building. So Jeff Damaris is here. He is the designer that helped us build out the way our building works. Uh, Mark from McHenry Architecture has helped us build um, all of the redesign of what was an industrial space. So there's Lincoln Perry. There's Will Sears in our office. This is just some of the design in our office. This is the newest space that we just opened, our mezzanine and our staff commons area. Um, I guess the big message is, is that good design, beautiful art, things that make us think, it tells our employees that we are curating the experience that we have at work. We are engaging thoughtfully in what we are building for them. And when they come to work, I think they get that. They feel that this is a place that is not just a cube farm where we're just trying to crank out some work and then go home. That we're actually really passionate about what we're doing and we care about their experience when they're in the building. 
Okay, I've told you a lot about how art is something that I use uh, to educate and speak and connect to audiences, how we use it at the IEPP to serve our business purposes, how powerful it is. Now let me use a piece of art to actually describe to you a moment that I think we are in, that I think describes the anxiety of a transitional age, because we really are in a transitional age. The digital revolution is only 25 years old. Um, and it is creating tremendous anxiety. Think of issues associated with privacy, of fake news, of election interference, of digital ethics, of algorithmic and AI accountability. All of these issues are brand new issues that we're struggling with. But it turns out if we look to art, we can see that those moments are not unique and we are not experiencing them as humankind for the first time. This is J.W. Turner. It's a piece that hangs in the British Museum in London, England. It's called The Fighting Temeraire Being Hauled Away to Scrap. And what it is, is a transitional moment. Um, it is the anxiety of a transitional moment. The transitional moment is Britain turning from an agrarian age of sale to the industrial economy. So the Fighting Temeraire was the greatest warship in the sailing fleet of the British Navy, which was really the pride of Britain. And so there's the Fighting Temeraire. It was Nelson's flagship in the Battle of Trafalgar. Mm. But as the industrial economy grew, as steam engines arrived, sail, the, the sailing ships were made redundant. Um, and as a result, the Fighting Temeraire was being hauled away for scrap. Turner shows us the anxiety of this moment in all sorts of ways. The sun is setting. It's a cloudy, milky picture. That's kind of the way he painted anyways. We have a ghostly image of the sailing ship behind. There is not only an anxiety, but a sadness to this piece, sort of a wistfulness uh, for what is passing. And I think if we understand the moment that we are in in that way, that we are letting go of the industrial era, the analog era, and arriving into the digital era. And that will necessarily create disruption and concern and anxiety. I think we'll be better able to tackle it. Now, art helps us do that. I think we can continue to use art to help us engage thought, tell stories that give us life, give life to those ideas. Um, we can use art and its awful manners to sit with those things that we can't quite solve yet, but we can understand them, embrace them, get deep into them. Uh, we can understand that art will often be an indicator of the things that we need to tackle from a legal or societal perspective. We can use art to bring people together um, to attract them into what we are doing. And we can use art to make people happy. Certainly the employees at the IEPP, I think, appreciate it. As a business leader, as a lawyer here in the Seacoast community, I really am proud and grateful for the ability to engage with um, the creative folks who are all around us. And there's so many of them in this room and around us here in the Seacoast area. And what I really love is how we've been able to connect that to the work of the IEPP, this incredibly complex, difficult work that we do at the IEPP to try and make privacy better, to try to create preserves of privacy. So ultimately, what do I think? I think art works. It works. <laughs> art works for the IEPP. And that's it, thank you. Is that good? Are we going to do questions? Great.